So this is a topic I really probably never thought I would be talking about. Um, in August, I uh, came down with the plague, otherwise known as COVID. So I had a lot of time to read, a lot of time to do, frankly, nothing. And one of the things I got off the bookshelf was Arthur Fremantle's Three Months in uh, the Southern States. And I hadn't read it in years, and I started going through it, and I kind of realized how interesting of a read it is and how much I kind of enjoyed reading it again. And the more I started going through, I was seeing all these people he mentions, and of course you see all the generals and political leaders in the Confederacy he meets. But I started to run into some of these other little characters he he encounters on his journey. And I started thinking, this is kind of interesting. And I started doing a little research on some of these. And next thing you know, I find a lot of connections that I think there's a little more to Fremantle's visit here um, than maybe just a simple war tourist, as, as he would have called himself. So when we think of Arthur Fremantle, obviously the, the image we have is from the 1993 movie Gettysburg. Obviously, we can see him here wearing a red coat because if he's British, he has to wear a red coat. Otherwise, it would confuse everybody. But he was not wearing a red coat uh, in the States. In fact, he wasn't wearing a military uniform at all. Uh, the photo to the right is Fremantle wearing the outfit that he had as he journeyed through the South and during the Gettysburg campaign. So a much different look than the guy holding the tea and uh, wandering around James Longstreet's camp. So most of what we know of Fremantle is really through the prism of the movie Gettysburg. And obviously he has a wonderful uh, diary that he kept. He is an interesting character. He adds a little bit of comedic relief uh, to the movie, but unfortunately it kind of obscures who the, the real individual was. Now, Fremantle is going to be born on November 11th, 1835. Uh, he is going to uh, be born to his father, uh, Lieutenant General John Fremantle, and his mother, Agnes Lyon. Uh, so, Arthur is actually going to be named uh, after the Duke of Wellington, who was Arthur Wellesley, uh, who had been the witness at his parents' wedding in 1829. Uh, his father is going to have a long connection with the Duke of Wellington that we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, his father came up through the British Army. Um, he took part uh, in an expedition, actually, uh, in Argentina uh, that did not go very well, uh, where he's actually captured. Uh, but then he is sent to Spain, where eventually he will be promoted uh, the aide-de-camp, as well as um, carrying dispatches for the Duke of Wellington during the Peninsular War. He will also take part in the Waterloo Campaign. So he's the aide-de-camp to the Duke of Wellington at one of the most famous battles in world history. So this is Fremantle's father. Uh, following uh, in his father's footsteps, Fremantle is going to join the army. Uh, he attends uh, the Royal Military College at Sandhurst, and he's initially commissioned in the British Army as an ensign in the 70th foot uh, before he's eventually sent to the 52nd uh, Infantry of Foot. But of course, then he becomes an ensign and a lieutenant in the unit that we all think of him as being a part of, eventually the Coldstream Guards. Uh, he is going to be promoted uh, continuously uh, in 1860 when he's 25 years old. He is going to hold the rank of captain in the Coldstream Guards, but lieutenant colonel in the Army. So this gets a little confusing because sometimes we'll see him referred to as Captain Fremantle, other times Lieutenant Colonel or Colonel Fremantle. I'm just going to call him Colonel. Uh, that's what we all kind of think of him as. So when he comes to the United States, uh, he is 27 years old. Now, when he enters the Army in 1852, you would think, hey, this is a guy that may have had a chance to see some action. Fremantle has yet to see any battle in his career. He is not in the Crimean War. Uh, he has not seen any action. So actually what he sees in the Civil War is probably going to be the first battle he was ever actually around as an individual. Now, our story begins with Fremantle and, and Gettysburg and all of places at Gibraltar. So we will see here real quick, we'll see a photo of his father uh, in the red coat to the left. And then we will see Arthur Fremantle in 1860. Uh, we believe that photo was taken of him. So our story, as I said, begins in Gibraltar. Now you're thinking, what does Gibraltar have to do with Gettysburg? Well, in, 18, in the early uh, portion of 1862, the famed Confederate commerce raider, Raphael Sims, is going to bring the CSS Sumter 
into Gibraltar for much needed repairs. While he is there, he is going to be under the eyes of the British authorities. And it's eventually going to be uh, the aide, the assistant military secretary of Governor John Codrington, that is going to deliver to, some, to the CSS Sumter um, all they need to know about how not to break the neutrality laws and possibly get England drawn into a global conflict. The individual that is going to go meet with Sims is none other than Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fremantle. Fremantle is going to be impressed by Sims and some of the stories he has. Uh, he is also going to give Raphael Sims a tour of the military post of Gibraltar. Uh, they will ride around and they obviously spent a day together discussing all matters of, of issues. And it's going to be at this time that Fremantle really starts thinking about possibly coming over to the United States and watching uh, our civil war. And in his book, um, Fremantle sort of tries to give his justification for what he's doing. And, and he is going to write, at the outbreak of the American War, in common with many of my countrymen, I felt very indifferent as to which side might win. But if I had any bias, any sympathies, they were rather in favor of the North on, dis on account of the dislike which an Englishman naturally feels at the idea of slavery. But soon a sentiment of great admiration for the gallantry and determination of these Southerners together with the unhappy contrast afforded by the foolish bullying conduct of the Northerners caused a complete revulsion in my feelings. And I was unable to repress a strong wish to go to America and see something of this wonderful struggle. One of the things that you will find in Fremantle's diary is almost, a, he's almost naive in, into what he is expecting in the war. He almost has this almost childlike glee at times about what he's experiencing. Um, for him, it seems more of a, a foreign trip than it does that you're in the middle of a war zone at times. And what I think is interesting is when you look at his journey, this is a gentleman that obviously knows people. He's well-connected, uh, but he is able to cr go from Southampton, England, all the way to Havana, Cuba, and then he is going to cross over into Matamoros, Mexico, and then cross the border uh, into Texas to avoid the Union blockade. Now, what's interesting is that he chooses to come through Mexico into Texas, which is where I began to kind of piece some of this story together. Now, he is going to leave England on March 2nd uh, on board the Royal Mail Steamer uh, at Trotto. You can see that here, this wonderful depiction of it. This is the ship that took uh, Fremantle to Cuba. And then from there, he actually takes a Royal Navy ship to Mexico, which I thought was kind of an interesting little uh, jaunt there. Now, if he is going to enter the Confederacy, he is going to need to know some people. He's going to need to know letters of introduction, because otherwise you have this British national crossing the border from Mexico into the United States or into the Confederate States in this matter. Uh, without any introduction, without anything, this could get problematic very quickly. But this is where I go back to the connection he has with Raphael Sims, one of the individuals that was vitally connected to Raphael Sims was James Bullock, uh, a Confederate agent who will be in England and really helps outfit a number of commerce raiders. But Bullock is going to be connected to the Confederate Signal Corps and the Confederate Secret Service, which if you're trying to get into a nation, it's not too bad to have people that are part of the intelligence, lack of a better term, deep state helping you here. So he is going to have clearly some uh, letters of introduction given to him before he departs England. One of those, based on Fremantle's own account, is to General John Magruder, which is who is in Texas at this time. Now, from here, it gets a little interesting. Uh, one of the individuals that had served under John Magruder early in the Civil War was William Norris, who eventually becomes head of the Confederate Signal Corps. Now, when we think of the Confederate Signal Corps, we think of them as being uh, comparable to their Union counterparts. They're relaying communications on the battlefield, but the Confederate Signal Corps did a little bit more than just that. What we are going to see is 
the initial connection between William Norris and John Magruder goes back all the way to when it wasn't the Army in Northern Virginia. It was uh, under General Beauregard at this point. Uh, so Captain Norris at this time was on John Magruder's staff. And it's going to be Magruder that gave Norris the necessary authority to establish the service of the Signal Corps and be its commanding officer. Later, this gets pro approved by the Confederate government. In the Southern Historical Papers, uh, they do note what the role of the Signal Corps was to be. One of the interesting notes that I found was it noted that we were in possession of important secrets. When occasion required, they became dauntless messengers and agents going into the enemy's lines and cities or to lands beyond the sea, communicating with agents and secret friends of the Confederate government and people, ordering supplies, conveying them to their destination, running the blockade by land and sea, making nightly voyages in bays and rivers, threading the enemy's cordon of pickets and gunboats, following blind trails through swamps and forest, and as much experts with oar and sail on deck and in the saddle, and with rifle and revolver as with flags, torches, telegraph, and secret cipher. This is not simply waving flags to send a message on a battlefield. So what we're beginning to see is that Fremantle is having some connections to some people that you would need to possibly move through the Confederacy and to get access to all the folks that he is going to meet. When he is traveling across the Atlantic, he is going to meet a Texas merchant by the name of McCarthy. That's all he lists him as in the book. So I was curious, who was this guy? We know that he lived in San Antonio. So I thought, well, I wonder if he shows up in the 1860 census. And sure enough, he shows up in the 1860 census for San Antonio as Justin McCarthy. Quick Google search finds that there is actually a collection of letters from McCarthy's wife to her mother in Missouri, which discusses his role as a Confederate purchasing agent in England. So this is not just some nice guy that Fremantle meets to get him across Texas. This is someone that is well connected with the Confederate government and involved with some of the, lack of a better term, secret agents and Signal Corps operations that will be going on. So even if Fremantle is not directly connected, he is indirectly connected with a lot of folks that would really serve him well getting into the United States. It just so happens when he crosses the uh, border in, from Mexico to Texas that the first individuals they find is Duff's Partisan Rangers. Their commander, uh, the officer by the name of Duff was actually the business associate of Justin McCarthy. So once again, an odd little coincidence uh, that we are going to see with Fremantle as he is making his way through uh, Mexico into Texas. Now he's eventually uh, going to come into the United States. He's going to meet with John Magruder. He's going to spend quite a bit of time in Texas, and he is going to be crossing at times, almost cross country uh, through the Texas Hill Country. Uh, from uh, basically Brownsville up to San Antonio. And a lot of the accounts that, that he gives really highlight what is like life on the frontier. Uh, at times, he is going to discuss seeing what he refers to as almost vigilante justice. A pro-unionist uh, individual is murdered by some of Duff's cavalry uh, before Fremantle arrives. He's actually going to find the body of the individual that is buried. Um, some pretty nasty stuff that he finds. So already he is seeing that this is not um, the fun trip that he's making it out to be. He will meet with John Magruder. He will also meet with General Hamilton B, who happened to be the brother of Bernard B, of First Manassas fame. And then he is eventually going to try to make his way from Texas into Louisiana. The only problem is, is right now, Louisiana is a challenging place to be. There are union operations throughout the state trying to cross the Mississippi River could be a challenge. So eventually he's going to make his way into Louisiana, into Mississippi, and eventually he heads to Mobile, Alabama. From Mobile, he is going to make his way uh, up to Birmingham, through Atlanta, over to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, to Wilmington, North Carolina, and then up to Petersburg and eventually to Richmond. Now, when he gets to Richmond, he is going to meet a handful of well-connected Confederate individuals. Uh, he is going to meet 
uh, President Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin. He is going to meet Alexander Stevens. He is going to meet a number of high-ranking individuals in Richmond, including now Major William Norris of the Signal Corps. Uh, he is going to say that Norris then attached a sergeant from the Signal Corps to me to help me get to Lee's army, which was then in the Shenandoah Valley, moving into Pennsylvania. So already we see this Signal Corps coming back into play. Uh, it's kind of funny, all these coincidences that seem to happen with Fremantle as he is making his way through. So once again, we will have the view of Arthur Fremantle here, and I want this to kind of get seared in everybody's mind. Um, I know it's hard to, to not see him as holding tea and uh, making comments about the Confederate Army, but this is what he would have looked like. Uh, until he spoke, he probably would have looked not that much different than a lot of the Confederates he was serving around. Uh, he wore a gray sporting coat. Uh, he wore the tall hat, the, the boots. Uh, this is his outfit that he had as he was making his way through and what he will be wearing when he is with Lee's army. Now, when he reaches Lee's army, uh, he's going to finally catch up to them right as they're entering Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So right at the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, when he arrives, he is joined by three other foreign observers to the Army in Northern Virginia. One is Captain Justice Scheibert of the Prussian Army, who is here observing Lee's army. The other is Captain Fitzgerald Ross, who was British, but was actually serving uh, Austria at this time, who was observing for Austria. And then he will find uh, Francis Lawley, who had worked for the Times of London, who was here covering the war. So he already finds this group of foreign observers, and they become fast friends. What is also nice about all of these observers is that even though Fremantle is probably the most famous of them, because he is the one that shows up in the movie, um, all four of them actually leave accounts of their time with Robert E. Lee's army during the Gettysburg campaign. Not only are they with Lee's army during this time, but they are at the highest levels of command. Many of them are spending time around James Longstreet's headquarters. They are meeting with Robert E. Lee. They're meeting Richard Yule. They meet A.P. Hill. Uh, they eventually meet Jeb Stuart. They're meeting a who's who of the Confederate Army and getting sort of this view from the inside of the Confederate High Command during the Gettysburg Campaign. What is also interesting is that if we compare the stories of Scheibert, Ross, Lawley, and Fremantle, we begin to see a number of individuals showing up again. They all happen to meet with Judah Benjamin while in the United States. They all meet with Jefferson Davis. They also all meet Major William Norris. So all of them have kind of the same way they are getting into here, some of the same people showing up, which once again, it makes me think there's a little more to Fremantle's story than uh, what's kind of being led on. Now, is he uh, a foreign observer officially? No, he is not. He is not here in any capacity, um, in a governmental capacity or a military capacity for Great Britain. He is here simply as an individual on his own. Of course, the Confederates see him as a potential asset. I mean, they want to sell themselves to England. They want to, they are still holding on to this dream of foreign recognition. So it is not uncommon to see Confederates meeting with some of these foreign individuals, maybe thinking they have more power than they really do. Um, even think back to the movie Gettysburg. What does James Kemper say to Fremantle? You know the Queen, uh, as if a lieutenant colonel in the Coldstream Guard can just go knock on Queen Victoria's door anytime he wants and say hello. Now, he will meet Queen Victoria. But to be a close confidant, uh, that is just not simply the case. But I think you see a little bit of maybe this optimism by the Confederates coming through. Now, Fremantle it gives us some very insightful accounts. Uh, one of those is on June 30th uh, when he meets Robert E. Lee for the first time. And he is going to learn from James Longstreet that George Meade has replaced Joseph Hooker as commander of the Army of the Potomac which at least this now shows that at least by June 30th, Confederate High Command at least has a sense of who is commanding the Union Army at this time. Obviously, this is a very fluid situation. Things are changing. They're getting intelligence reports. But clearly, uh, this is now known by June 30th. And this is, of course, going to be reported to Fremantle himself. 
Uh, he is also in his diary going to mention on June 30th, he mentions that he meets Longstreet's spy. Of course, this may be the famous spy Harrison. We're not totally sure, uh, but it is a spy of Longstreet's who is going to tell Fremantle that there is a concentration of Union troops at Gettysburg on June 30th. Obviously, this is going to be uh, John Buford's cavalry division, which had entered the town that day. So here's Fremantle now on the cusp of the Battle of Gettysburg, and he is going to accompany the high command through this battle. They are going to be riding uh, down the Chambersburg Pike when they begin to hear uh, the fighting that is taking place. Now, he is going to miss the fighting on July 1st, uh, but he will be here for the fighting on the 2nd and the 3rd. Uh, one of the things he is going to do is find an observation post which is somewhere on Seminary Ridge, likely around the Lutheran Theological Seminary. And as he's doing this, he uses this as kind of his post of, of observation. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of the tree. We do not have uh, a lot to go on, but we do have an artist's depiction. We have the Don Troiani print here, uh, Decision at Dawn, which of course we will see Robert E. Lee uh, looking down. You will see Henry Heath with the bandage on his head. Uh, you'll see A.P. Hill. We see also John Bell Hood and James Longstreet whittling sticks, uh, which Fremantle does talk about this quintessential American pastime of whittling sticks. But let's forget the Confederate High Command for a moment. Let's look at who we have around. With the spy glasses in hand was Captain Justice Schubert of the Prussian Army. Beside him is our good friend Arthur Fremantle. Below is going to be Fitzgerald Ross in his very fine Austrian uniform. And then we'll see Francis Lawley there as well. So this is where they're going to watch a lot of the action here. Uh, he actually witnesses the meeting that, me, that Lee has with his high commanders on Seminary Ridge on July 2nd, one of the more important meetings of the Battle of Gettysburg, where, of course, Lee is going to be laying out his strategy for the next for the day of the 2nd. He is also going to note that when he meets A.P. Hill, Hill is going to complain of being ill. So another uh, item that we can kind of verify with what's going on. So he is going to observe the fighting on July 2nd from this position. He is going to report that at about 2 o'clock on the advice of General James Longstreet, he is going to move into place, but he's frustrated the attack does not go off until 4 o'clock. Uh, while he is there, this is going to be the first time that he hears the rebel yell. Uh, he is also going to note that Confederate bands were playing polkas and waltzes as this is going on. One of the more famous accounts of the bands playing as this is happening. He is also going to hear word that evening of the wounding of John Bell Hood and also of the death of General William Barksdale. Uh, which this is on the night of the second. So we know Barksdale isn't dead just yet, uh, but obviously the word has reached the Confederate High Command, at least Longstreet's headquarters, of what is going on. Now, on the morning of July 3rd, uh, Captain Fitzgerald Ross and Colonel Fremantle are going to head into Gettysburg itself. Uh, they are initially trying to get into the cupola uh, of the seminary. They will have problems doing that, and then they'll move back into town trying to find an observation point to watch the attack that's going to come. When they are sort of frustrating this, they head back to Longstreet's headquarters. This in the early afternoon. This is where Fremantle will find Longstreet sitting on a fence. Thinking the battle is just beginning, Fremantle is going to comment to Longstreet that he wouldn't have missed this for anything. Longstreet is going to point out to Fremantle that the attack has already happened, it's been repulsed, and it is a very rough day for the Confederates. Longstreet at this point is going to ask Fremantle if he had anything to drink, at which point Fremantle pulls out his silver hip flask, which he is going to gift to General James Longstreet. Certainly after what happened on July 3rd, James Longstreet's going to need a drink at the minimum. He is also at this time going to watch Robert E. Lee rallying his troops after Pickett's charge. He is expecting at any moment a Union counterattack, which of course never materializes. And then Fremantle is going to begin the retreat back to the, uh, with the Army of Northern Virginia back towards the Potomac beginning on 
July 4th. But while he's in Gettysburg, he runs into a little bit of problems. Now, as we noted, there wasn't a lot that Fremantle discusses always about all the inner workings. And for the most part, he did not leave any official record beyond his diary of what he did here. But going through the official records, I was just curious to see if there's any mentions of Arthur Fremantle. There's not. But if you look in the supplement to the ORs, you will find that he is noted. And it actually involves the theft of a good bit of money from the tent of Major Raphael Moses, who was the chief commissary of subsistence for, for the First Corps. Uh, at, on the night of the third into the fourth, someone sneaks into the tent and steals a chest filled with Confederate currency, even some North Carolina banknotes, which made me a little upset. And I don't worry about the Virginia currency that much. So we do have the accounts that they're going to give. On July 27th, Moses gives his deposition for what happens. And he is going to write that on the morning of July 4th, between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock a.m. near Gettysburg, his tent was entered by some person or persons unknown to the department and his trunk taken, therefore, carried into the field about 200 yards to the rear, broken open by cutting the top and bottom with an axe. The contents that were taken were over $10,000 of Confederate currency, uh, $700, additional, $700 additionally, and then we will have banknotes over $10,000 and over $1,500 in bills from the state of North Carolina. This money is never recovered. Of course, this is a big issue. If you have that much money going missing on your watch, people have to account for it. We will also see, uh, giving his recollections of the event to Moxley Sorrell, who we all know of Longstreet staff, uh, was Major Samuel Phillips, who belonged to the First Corps, uh, who is also going to note the same thing. But then we finally, on July 8th, get the written deposition of Lieutenant Colonel Arthur James Lyon Fremantle, Coldstream Regiment of Guards, British Army. This is written from Hagerstown on July 8th, 1863. I, Arthur Fremantle, a captain and lieutenant colonel in Her Majesty's Coldstream Regiment of Guards, British Army, hereby declare that on the night of the 3rd, I slept in the tent with Major Moses, Chief Commissary of General Longstreet, Confederate Army near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I went to sleep about 11 p.m. and before doing so, observed a trunk inside the door of the tent, which I knew belonged to Major Moses. When I awoke in the morning about 5 a.m., I heard Major Moses' servant remark that the trunk was gone, and I could not perceive it anywhere. After a considerable search, the trunk was brought in by two servants, having been found in a line of woods close by. The trunk had been broken open, and all the garments and documents were brought in separately, having evidently been strewed about in the wet grass. No money was brought in, although... To the best of my belief, I heard Major Moses remark that a large amount of public and private money was kept in it. I was not a week, I was not woke up by the abduction of the trunk, but I am a heavy sleeper and had been much fatigued by the day, by the hard day's exertion. Signed, Arthur Fremantle, Lieutenant and Captain, Coldstream Guards. Which I always think is kind of an interesting story that we have this heist of money just as the Confederates were getting out of town. I would love to know who took the money. Uh, was it a Confederate officer? Was it a soldier? We mentioned they note the servants. Obviously, these are slaves. Possibly could it have been a slave that took this money, being in Pennsylvania, you have easy access to uh, freedom. So who knows? But it's kind of an interesting story. Now, Fremantle is going to remain with Lee's army until Hagerstown, when eventually he realizes he needs to get back to England. His term of service is almost up. So as Fremantle does this, he is going to be pro is problematic because he's got to get over to Union lines. How do you do that? You know, here he is. He's been hanging out with Confederates this whole time. Letters of introduction from the Confederacy is not going to do him any good. So on July 7th, Fremantle takes his leave of Longstreet and his staff, and he is going to try to make his way to New York City. Uh, at this point, one of Longstreet's staff officers said, you may take your oath because you might be caught as a spy. Longstreet, though, was more confident in Fremantle's abilities, uh, informing his staff that since Fremantle had managed to travel across uh, the very lawless areas of Texas, crossing into Union lines would cause him little difficulty. 
So away Fremantle goes, making his way to Union lines. Eventually he is brought to Union General Benjamin Kelly, who is going to interview him. They realize that his story checks out and he is going to make his way to New York City. He is, he is going to show, though, a pass from one of Longstreet's staff declaring that he is a neutral. So this was at least looked at favorably by Kelly. Now, as he makes his way to New York, he is in New York at a very interesting time. Uh, he is going to arrive by train in New York City on the night of July 12th. He is going to stay at a hotel on Fifth Avenue. The following day, Fremantle discusses going out for a walk along Broadway. Upon his return to his hotel, he finds that shopkeepers are closing their stores early and shuttering the doors. He notices also that several buildings are now ablaze. He notices fire engines moving all about, uh, but the crowd was preventing them from being used. Uh, becoming concerned, Fremantle even watches a young African-American male being pursued by a mob, eventually finding uh, protection in a company of soldiers. He has seen the New York draft riots. This is what he is witnessing firsthand. So think about what he has seen in just the three months he is in the United States. He has been at the highest levels of Confederate government. He has watched one of the most important battles, the American Civil War. And not only that, he's now in New York during the draft riots. Eventually, uh, he is going to have to take cover on a British ship which then has to moor underneath a French warship to protect it from the armed mob. Fremantle will even discuss how African-American sailors from the British ships, excuse me, African uh, British sailors were being pulled off of those ships. This is a horrific scene that he is viewing. Uh, from there, on July 15th, he is going to leave the United States and heads back to England. Now, when he arrives back in England, his journey was well known. People are interested in what he has seen, what he has experienced, and he is going to find himself, at least according uh, to his account, being questioned by friends and colleagues about what the situation was like in the South. Many in England were only getting the view from Northern papers, which they felt were you know, misleading them. So let's look at see what things were like in the South. So Fremantle says, hey, I had this diary I was keeping. Let's publish it. And eventually it is going to be published. In 1864, it is published in both Great Britain and the United States. And it's going to be printed first in Mobile, Alabama by the S.H. Gotzel Company, uh, which is going to print his account. It was well received in England and in the South. Now, Fremantle, though, uh, discusses what he sees, but his prediction of what's going to happen is proven incorrect. He's actually going to predict the South is going to win the war. Obviously, that does not hold up very well uh, as uh, the war is going to end in 1865, but his book is a success. Fremantle is going to get married uh, soon after his return to Great Britain, and he's going to serve in the British military in, for the rest of his life until 1901. Uh, he is, in 1880, he is going to be placed on half pay uh, after 28 years of service. And during this time, he has not seen any action at all. The only combat he has witnessed still by the 1880s is what he witnessed at Gettysburg, then on the retreat uh, from Gettysburg. But in 1881, he is going to be assigned as aide de camp to Prince George, the Duke of Cambridge, who was the commander in chief of the British Army. He is eventually going to see action in, in the Sudan, where he is actually going to command a brigade in fighting there. So he does eventually see some action in the Sudan. And in February of 1893, he is going to become the commander-in-chief in Scotland. He is only going to hold this position for less than a year. But he's going to end his career on a very high note. He is eventually going to be appointed as the governor of Malta in January of 1894. It is during this time that Fremantle becomes a very popular governor of the island. He is going to make a number of changes uh, there over political and social issues. Um, even uh, he is going to settle the matter of mixed marriages between Catholic and non-Catholics, which he is going to say is okay. He is also going to deal with reparations um, from citizens on Malta dealing all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars, which I find kind of interesting, these wars that his father took part in, 
We're going to have Fremantle trying now to handle reparations and other matters that people were still contesting from uh, the wars at the early part of the 19th century. He is also, while governor of Malta, going to meet the German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, who is going to dine with Fremantle. Eventually, uh, in 1899, Fremantle sees his time in Malta end, and he is going to be eventually promoted to lieutenant general in the British Army. Uh, he is also going to be appointed a knight. So this is where we now get Sir Arthur Fremantle. And Fremantle is going to die at the age of 65 uh, from complications due to asthma. He is going to be in Brighton along the coast uh, when he passes away. Of course, Fremantle first becomes reintroduced back to the American public uh, actually, in 1952, when the historian Walter Lord of Titanic fame and other historic works is going to publish a revised edition of his Three Months in the Southern States, retitled The Fremantle Diary, uh, which is going to feature an introduction by Lord as well as references and other matters in it. It is, of course, going to be this book published in 1952 that is eventually going to make its way into the hands of a writer of fiction named Michael Shara, who of course is going to include Fremantle in his uh, book, The Killer Angels, and then eventually where he will be uh, brought into the movie Gettysburg. As a result, Fremantle is maybe one of the most famous British officers, at least in the mind of Civil War buffs, during the war. I ask most Civil War buffs, name one officer in the British Army during the 1860s. That's easy. That's Arthur Fremantle. Uh, we all know Fremantle. What we don't know, though, are the others that went with him. Uh, Schubert, Ross, and Lawley, um, their memoirs are all published, uh, but they don't get nearly the attention that Fremantle's does. Uh, so in many ways, Fremantle kind of becomes the embodiment of these foreign observers, which is a very interesting way to view the Civil War. All of us, in some respects, view it through the prism of being an American war. Uh, we as Americans view it in that way. Of course, Fremantle is viewing it as a neutral observer, although he does become an ardent Confederate, even to the point after the war, where he is going to donate to a fund to assist General Robert E. Lee. So he is still not fully reconstructed, for lack of a better term. And interestingly enough, Shibert, Ross, Fremantle, and Lawley all are very pro-Confederate in their sentiments, which isn't it ironic that pro-Confederate individuals with those sentiments from Europe make their way into Lee's army during this pivotal campaign where the fate of the Confederacy might be hanging in the balance. Who better to watch this great Confederate victory that they were expecting in Pennsylvania than these foreign observers who could then report back. Uh, in fact, Fremantle is going to carry back mail for Scheibert back to Europe. Uh, Scheibert says, I haven't been able to talk to my family in months, so could you carry this mail back? Also, he will have discussions with uh, Jefferson Davis, which seem to suggest, hey, can you convince the British to come on to our side? So as we look at this book, look at when it's published, 1864. This is an interesting time. Uh, the fortunes of the war have gone against the Confederacy. Uh, this book is a very pro-Confederate look. It received a wide audience. I am not saying that Fremantle was a Confederate agent per se, but I think certainly he was a conduit for very pro-Confederate, for really lack of a better term, propaganda to be published throughout England. This was a very well-read uh, book. It was actually, uh, excerpts of it were in Blackwood's Literary Magazine, which had a large circulation in England at the time. Uh, you see in British newspapers, advertisements for this all over the place. So it was well-read. But then it gets introduced to us again in 1952, which of course is what we have today. There are a number of, uh, a number of editions um, of the Fremantle Diary or three months in the Southern States. It's readily accessible. And I would highly recommend you know, if you get a chance to read it, please do. Um, obviously there's some things that do not age well. Um, often the, when, he is in, when he's meeting with Confederates, they'll always talk about when the issue of slavery comes up, they'll talk about how all the slaves are very happy. They're well treated and all of these things. That's a message that certainly would have played well, at least they thought in England. Uh, so we can already see that uh, maybe Fremantle falls for a little bit of the uh, allure of the Confederate Army, not so much the, the reality of it. 
but it is a timeless work. It is one of the more important primary source documents of the Gettysburg campaign, all of the foreign observers. Um, I think they give us a really important view that doesn't often get considered. Uh, we don't always have the accounts that we want from Lee and Longstreet and Hill and others, but we do have these observers that were watching them and taking notes. So between uh, Fremantle, uh, Scheibert, Ross and Lawley, we have a wonderful account of what's going on at Lee's headquarters and around uh, this time, also Longstreet's as well. And I think it's very interesting that they all tended to gravitate to James Longstreet. Um, we know that Longstreet does use spies, so obviously he would have had some connections with the Confederate Secret Service in that respect and the Signal Corps. Uh, so we do see some kind of overlaps here that are very interesting. Uh, this is something that I am still spending a good bit of time researching on. I have definitely gone down the rabbit hole, which is trying to figure out the connections of these people. Uh, try not to put the tinfoil hat on if I can avoid it, but uh, there's much more to this story, which I am really enjoying sort of unearthing a lot of these things. Uh, so my working theory right now is I think he had assistance by the Confederacy to get into the South. I think that there was already hopes that he was going to publish some work based on his time. I don't think it was simply his friends and colleagues saying, you should let us know what's going on. I think there were already plans in place for that by the time he arrives. Uh, he arrives back, the book is quickly published. This is not a long layover before we see it. So I think we have to certainly take that into account. So that is the life of Arthur Fremantle. I think it is much more uh, interesting than I think maybe the uh, way he is presented in the book, The Killer Angels, or in the movie. I think there's a lot more to him. As a person, he was a very affable individual. Everybody talked about how nice he was and how easy he got along with everybody, which certainly would have helped him making his way through the South. And I think he gives a very interesting view of life in the South in the summer of 1863. He gives a contemporary view of what he's seen. And so some of what you will see with Fremantle, you'll look at and go, ah, that doesn't really age well. That's really kind of shocking what he's saying. But it gives us an insight into the Confederate mindset in 1863, which I think is critical. And he has seen the Confederacy from the very lowest levels in the lawless areas of Texas all the way to the highest levels of Confederate government and military circles. So he sees the entire gamut. He also goes into almost every state in the Southern Confederacy, uh, which is pretty remarkable while he's here. So he covered a lot of ground in three months while he was here in the southern states and of course leaves us with a very wonderful memoir so with that that's the life of arthur fremantle uh, so i am happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have about him and we will see what the discussion takes us and this is of Great course shot. fremantle in his later years and i like it with all the medals and everything else uh, they just don't make military uniforms like that anymore uh, that's what all military uniforms should look like so, so happy to answer any questions anybody might have. All right, Eric, thank you. I'm just on everybody. I'm unlocking you now. Um, you can unmute yourselves and you can start your videos. And while Eric takes a break, um, are you are you still here, Tim? You want to uh, tell her what you're going to do next week? And I think we're good to go. Tim Pierce, are you here? All right, maybe if he is, I can't find him. Well, if I find him, we'll bring him back on. Next week, um, it's gonna be the 90, uh, Pennsylvania, oh, is he there? Yeah. Hang on, hang on. There I am. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, couldn't, I couldn't unmute, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, so next week, um, doing a thing on the Pennsylvania reserves. All right. Um, a little bit from the beginning, from their inception up through up through um, when they were discharged, I guess. Good. Uh, looking forward to it. All so, right. So. <laughs> no, your hand was up first and then Bosch. Go ahead, Alex. You just have to unmute. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that, y'all. I was just waiting on uh, the little message there. 
Hey, Eric, great presentation. Again, thanks to you, uh, 763 Leaders, for allowing this to happen tonight. Um, my question is, how do you take Fremantle's observation versus, let's say, Henry Heath's, Heath's responses to the Count of Paris, mm -hmm. um, since that was kind of done years later, since I know, you know, you all tend to stress sometimes you got to take stuff with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to do was when you when I read Fremantle's diary, I went back and read what Lolly said, what Ross said, um, and what Scheibert said. And for the most part, their stories check out. And all of these books and memoirs were published at different times. To my knowledge, they not all got back together and said, hey, let's get our story straight here. Um, so it does check out. It also checks out with accounts that we know of the battle, which whenever you're examining any primary source, you have to try to vet it against what you have. So when we're looking at things that are from Longstreet's staff, James Longstreet talks about them in his memoirs. Um, we see what these foreign observers are saying. It all kind of checks out. There's very few things in the Fremantle diary, at least with the Battle of Gettysburg, that when I look at it, I go, that just doesn't make sense. That's just not right. So it is a contemporary document. Even if he did edit it later, he's writing it from a diary he was keeping at the time. So as far as a primary source account goes, I would consider it pretty strong. I think it's a, a very reliable source that, that could be looked to at the battle. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I got, yeah, and, and that's why I kind of 